just a slight criticism of what I've heard. One of the parts that dis disturbed me about commentary in Australia about economics is that we look at debt as being bad. When I studied economics, there's good debt and bad debt, and the good debt is it's pay it's it's demand it's denominated in Australian dollars by Australians. That money comes back in a form, some of it money comes back in the form of tax. The, the, the debt that's bad, inverted commas, is foreign debt. Could you want to comment on that? Either of you? Yes, I, 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 thank you, Joe. I, I think it's a very good point. I, I noticed Scott Morrison does himself talk about good debt and bad debt. My take on it is rather different. I don't think it's anything to do with uh, uh, whether it's denominated locally or internationally. I take a view as to whether it's used productively or not. Yes. When I'm talking to students at the university, I often say, well, imagine a carpenter who's perhaps just finished his or her apprenticeship. Sure, you want to buy a damn good set of tools, you want to buy a, a little ute so as you can get around and do the job, earn some income, and it's sensible to go into debt to buy those tools in the ute because that will enhance your future income earning capacity and you'll be able to pay back the debt from the, the revenue you get w working as a carpenter or other tradesman. So uh, that is good debt, it seems to me, because it's invested in productive activity that more than handsomely pays off. Uh, if you borrow money, though, to go and have a holiday in Bali, that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th that, that's, that's just stupid. <laughs> I mean, don't come to my barley. <laughs> Go to surfers, wh wherever you want. But, but please uh, bear in mind that if you do that, you're acting in a way that's profligate and uh, not sustainable. Um, there's middling positions where, like governments, for example, if they borrow in order to fund their current expenditures, yes, they've got to pay those new start payments, they've got to pay uh, for the NDIS program and so on. And it, in the extreme, uh, it may be necessary to borrow to fund those current and ongoing expenses. But in general, you would rather not do that uh, because that's, uh, it's neither good nor bad debt, but you know, it depends on the macroeconomic conditions. It's, it's a difficult political, economic, social judgment. Uh, now, I, I've made already what's quite a long answer without any explicit reference to whether or not the money is borrowed from overseas or not. Uh, I think there are more hazards in uh, overseas borrowings. I mean, there's, there's more uncertainties about changing currency exchange rates over time. Uh, but certainly borrowing from the Australian people is like one member of the household lending money to other members of the household so that the household as a whole can prosper. So I think that is, in any people's language, good debt. Could I just say very quickly that um, yeah, uh, Australia has had, the f federal government since federation has had a deficit or and debt, um, cumulative deficits, um, most of the time since federation. So if it was so terrible, you'd think Australia would be a total basket case rather than one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And I'll say one more thing about the, the recent circumstances where I do think Australia missed a golden opportunity to invest more in those productive assets that Frank was talking about, or productive industries that would enhance the economy, economy's capacity um, in the future, when we had historically low interest rates that might now be trending up. So it seemed like a good time to invest in ourselves, and perhaps that would have had a good flow-on effect uh, in terms of wages growth? I've got two questions. Um, firstly, the rather right-wing economist, Peter Swan, I read an article and he said that um, the corporate tax cuts would cost Australians two and a half grand each. So can you comment on that? But the second one is um, the 200,000 income mark seems like about the sweet spot 
for people who buy properties. Do you think that this tax cut is kind of designed to perhaps keep the housing market up and that kind of thing? I think on the latter question, you know, people on 200,000 a year are, I think, the top 3% of tax filers. So they, they, they might keep... So are you saying up to 200,000? Do you think that their tax cut is possibly a way of... Keeping the housing bubble going? Yeah. Um, you know, no. That, that would be my short answer. And mainly because the big tax cuts don't come in for seven years, even if the entire package got passed tomorrow by a Senate that suddenly fell in love with big increases in inequality. Um, so I don't think that's justification. I, I think it's maybe a little bit more of, of not letting go of that neoliberal dream, if you like, of this low tax, you know, flat, flat tax as possible kind of... Uh, Paradise, it was far more of a um, crusading project in the 1990s, the 1980s, 1990s, up to the GFC, when it took a, a major punch in the face. The first part of the question was about the uh, size of the corporate tax cuts. Uh, it's rather interesting that the Treasurer didn't make any reference to that during his speech, but it's still there as part of the budget forecast uh, on the assumption that it can get through the Senate the uh, big tax cuts to the, the top end of town. I think it's very unlikely, and uh, for, for no other reason, which isn't the best economic reason, but the, the Royal Commission in, in, into the banks. I don't think the Australian people right now are aware a major tax cuts of which uh, about a quarter of the benefit goes to the big four Australian banks who are so much on the nose uh, because of the uh, revelations of, of the current Royal Commission. So, I, I, frankly, I think that's dead in the water, but it's a an, an, an good riddance, I say, because whether it amounts to $2,000 per head uh, of the Australian uh, population, as Peter Swan apparently forecasts, or, or not, I don't know. I think at, at any price, it, it's, it's a stupid way of uh, giving away public money to people who, who uh, haven't... Uh, any particular case for it and the, the, the arguments being put by the incumbent government which are all about how it's going to stimulate the economy, lead to higher levels of investment, higher levels of wages, higher levels of employment. Uh, well, oh God, I, I think I just saw a pink elephant fly overhead with, with the tooth fairy in the saddle. I mean, you know, the, it, it, it's cloud cuckoo land. Uh, hi, uh, my question uh, is regarding inequality. Uh, both of you spoke about uh, how this budget doesn't address that issue, uh, but it's hardly surprising uh, coming from uh, uh, Scomo, as you call him. Yeah? Now, my question is, why is it that inequality is not made a front and center by the political parties? They talk about surplus. They always say we'll have a surplus in two years' time uh, or three years' time, or they will say, like you said, the, the tax to GDP ratio or something. Uh, even, even the opposition, inequality is politically not made front and central, as I feel once that is addressed, many of the other problems of um, uh, um, uh, welfare or uh, New Start 11, all these things would all be somehow, it will all be uh, sorted out once you make inequality front and central. Politically, no doubt economists like yourselves are addressing it, I agree. But politically speaking, it is always somehow in the back burner, unless Bill Shorten in today's speech somehow uh, gets the nirvana and says inequality, that's what we want. So, your comments, please. I could talk until midnight on, on, on this topic. Uh, uh, we have to finish at 7.30, and we do have quite a long queue, but let me just say a couple of words. Firstly, that uh, I think it, it's easy for politicians on the right to denounce anyone talking inequality as fueling class conflict, uh, the politics of envy. Uh, these are phrases that trip easily off the tongues of conservative politicians. 
Uh, my view is, of course, that it, it's not talking about inequality that creates class conflict, it's class conflict uh, uh, that, that creates inequality. And the sooner we start talking about it, the better. Um, but you can see how it, 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 it even a, a fairly, uh, I'm just trying to find the right technical term, piss weak um, uh, <laughs> Labour politician like Wayne Swan, who was treasurer talk more about balanced budgets than anyone else I can recall. Indeed, it was, was largely part of the problem of setting this arbitrary target of balanced budgets or surplus budgets uh, for the foreseeable future, which no government e ever, ever meets for reasons that, that Troy enumerated earlier. But so even Wayne Swan is, is a strong advocate of putting inequality on the agenda. He wrote a book called Postcode, which says inequality is all about where you live. Well, not quite, Wayne, but uh, it's also about where you work and who your parents are and a lot of other uh, socially relative factors of that kind. But uh, it, it does need to be front on, uh, and foremost on the agenda, and there's no better mechanism for dealing with inequality than budgets because it's directly in the government's hands to develop that budget, the patterns of taxation, the patterns of expenditure, who pays, who gets, it's right there on the table. And uh, to say, oh, we're not concerned with that, is frankly uh, mythology, because every decision that's made about the budget is a decision about redistribution. You're either redistributing to the rich or you're redistributing to the poor. And you and you might as well be honest about what you're doing rather than talk in terms of glib phrases about you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. I'll just add very quickly that I'd, I'd add bargaining to budgets, right, in terms of reducing inequality. What's going to get you a better wage outcome? Um, collective bargaining's shown to be a pretty effective means of achieving that over time, and we've, of course, seen a fall in union membership rates from 40% in the late 1980s to uh, down to 15% today. So that's a very significant factor in our conversations about, um, about inequality. Just on the, on the Labor Party, I think increasingly the Labor Party politicians, including a lot of the head honchos, they talk about inequality far more than they used to. People like Andrew Lee write books about inequality with quite a lot of good data you know, the, being the, the pickety of Australia. But it, it, it's whether they can shed some of that uh, neoliberal skin, I'm sorry to keep using that term, around um, what was Chris Bowen talking about the other day, you know, sustainable surpluses and clear fiscal rules or something like that. You know, and how those two competing obje objectives of you know this fetishization of things like a budget surplus versus reducing inequality, um, which comes out on top if and when the Labor Party returns to power. Troy, you mentioned um, John Howard. Uh, he he agreed fine after many years to he sh we should raise um, the new start allowance. Um, what does he see that others don't see in the soulless neoliberals? Secondly. Um, what happens to previous budgets, if they're not fulfilled, do they get put on the shelf or updated or do they get relegated? Or do they get absorbed into current budgets or future budgets? And thirdly, if we have half a billion dollars worth, of, half a trillion dollars worth of debt, do we actually specify where our debts are owed to? For example, particular names of banks, governments, families or other trusts, so that people have an idea about are we actually owning it to facade accounts or actual genuine uh, lenders? The first one was about, you know, John Howard and Start. I mean, pretty much everyone... One, one thing about politicians, they often become much better once they leave, when, once they don't have any power, right? So, um, you know, the fact is that almost everyone, except it seems the politicians in power, supports increasing Start. Because you'd increase New Start by, you know, 20, 30 per cent, and it'll cost you two, three billion dollars, which is a rounding error in the budget. You know, so that is the the easiest, straightforward thing we can do to help 
the neediest in our society. Um, the debt question, there'd be a breakdown of the Commonwealth's liabilities. A lot of them would be, you know, to other Australians, big pension funds, to the Reserve Bank. Some of it would be, you know, foreign owned or something. But it, that, that question of debt and who it's... Who, who holds the, those bonds, for example, is important. So, you know, Japan has an incredible debt-to-GDP ratio, but it's almost all owed to Japanese citizens, right? So the, the composition of the debt does matter. The one other thing I want to say about the, you know, the, the gross debt versus net debt, that's important because we have, the Commonwealth has net assets like the Future Fund, which is our sort of sovereign wealth fund that the great Peter Costello finally set up. Um, so, you know, we still have one of the lower net debt to GDP ratios in the world. We've we got to, again, when I come back to the point of big numbers, the Australian economy is about $2 trillion. So let's keep that in perspective when we think about a scary number like three, four, five hundred billion dollars net or gross debt, depending on what you're looking at, that we have one of the biggest economies in the world and one of the wealthiest societies in the world. I can't remember the second question. Yeah, I'll for the, 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 there's a middle part, which is what happens to this year's uh, budget and uh, next year and the year after that, do they all get rolled together into some sort of snowball <laughs> that it cascades down the hill, picking up more as it goes? Sh short answer is, it's, it, in this respect, uh, a, 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 a government budget is much like a household budget. I mean, it, it, it's a statement of intent, if you don't uh, do what you intended, well, you, you draw up another budget down the track in the hope of doing better next time. Uh, but there's no... Uh, I mean, the cumulative effect is what's actually happening out there in the economy, not, not what's actually happening in the books. Uh, budgets are always wrong. I ask that because yeah. a lot of our decisions and our behaviour is actually directly dependent on the so-called forecasts and budgets. Yeah, yeah. And when it affects people directly and in the real world, yeah. you can't just turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, or I just update yeah, the piece yeah. of paper. So there is no accountability or um, responsibility on behalf of the people making these budgets. Well... Well, they need to be held a little bit uh, more um, accountable than what they are so far. There's, there's two two aspects to accountability. I mean, one is you're accountable for what you project and what you promise. Uh, so that, that's what I call political accountability. Yes, I'm going to cut taxes because there's an election coming up next year and I think people are gonna, more likely to vote me because I've done that. Now, the electorate will make its own judgments. Uh, I mean, in the light of what uh, Troy said a bit earlier about surveys carried out, it may be that the electorate will punish governments for making that commitment. It may well be that, that uh, the days of the pre-election tax cut bribe are over. Maybe the electorate out there, just, or at least a sig significant part of it, is sufficiently long-sighted to recognise that you know, it can't be bought off by a few dollars, uh, you know, a tax cut, if that's going to burden the next generation of Australians, their own children, for example, with, with higher levels of debt, w poorer public services, not to mention uh, irreversible climate change, which we're not addressing, and therefore passing down the line to future generations. Now, those, those are what I would call elements of political accountability that are quite strong in any democratic system, in any system in which there are periodic elections. There is at least the opportunity to say yay or nay to the people uh, who, who've made those policies uh, and uh, kick them out if we don't like what they're doing. But there is a more subtle uh, element, which I think you're alluding to, that I if a government acts irresponsibly, if its projections are way out of kilter, if they are dodgy numbers, as, as Troy puts it, then there is an element of deceit here, and people who act on the expectation that these things are actually true will be misled. 
Now, whether they'll blame the government for that or not, I don't know, because governments will want to say, look, we, you know, we, we're just doing our best, but the future is inherently uncertain. Uh, oh, we didn't know there was another global financial crash around the corner. That's blown everything off track. Uh, we acted with the best of intentions, but now things have turned out rather worse that, that, than we expected. A bit like the weather. Uh, I mean, we had a, this beautiful warm autumn. Tony Abbott presumably saying, I told you so. Uh, you know, that, that we're all enjoying the benefits of this warm climate. And then suddenly, tonight, it all gets cold. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> for, for, for a shocker of a weekend. Oh, cold and windy. Uh, oh, I didn't know that was coming. Bugger. Troy, towards the end of your talk, you alluded to um, a, t a taxation cap, and it was related, I think you said, to the, um, the uh, John Howard um, GST introduction and the global financial crisis. Um, that is a period of time that began 18 years ago and ended roughly nine years ago. What is the significance of that? And again, what was the me mechanism you uh, talked about? I missed it. This is the, uh, the 20 budget cap. Yeah, the 23 uh, None. There, there's, there's no... It's an arbitrary period of time, as you identified, and it's an arbitrary number that is really there to serve a political purpose. If you remember at when... Um, Tony Abbott, our great Prime Minister, was elected. He um, had the Commission of Audit, right? And that that rep that recommended a whole lot of, you know, sweeping. I've got to stop using this term neoliberal reforms. You know, harsh cuts to this, that, and the other. And that 23.9 percent figure, I think, appeared in the Commission of Audit. And then, after it appears in a document, it takes on a life of its own. I think we just need to all in this room be very, very clear that it has absolutely no scientific underpinning empirical justification, uh, rhyme nor reason. And I might say, just to add to that, uh, if you look around the world, the, uh, the government expenditure to GDP ratio varies enormously. I think in the, the Nordic countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, it's probably somewhere around 40, am I right, Stuart? Yeah. And uh, they, they haven't exactly uh, crashed. They're, they're some of the most livable societies in the world. The, the climate is a bit cool. Uh, and, and the days are a bit short in, in the winter, but you can't blame the, the, the size of the uh, government expenditure for that. Uh, but give it, you know, if we're talking social democracy, we're normally talking higher rates of taxation to fund better quality of public services and, dare I say it, because this is Troy's PhD topic, possibly even a basic income for all citizens. It is affordable. You've just got to go a bit beyond that ceiling, I think, to get a basic income that would give everyone a, a, a poverty line a wage, irrespective of whether they work or not. But it seemed to me that that's the sort of social policy that could actually be rather exciting and engaging. Now, there's pros and cons, and Troy's thesis is going to uh, show, show all, all of the evidence and some calculations about the affordability of this kind of policy. But a better funded public sector, uh, Nordic style, a basic wage, uh, perhaps even a more generous approach to foreign aid so that we become a good, responsible, global citizen. Uh, these could be possible if, if we accepted uh, that we need to move beyond arbitrary limits. All right, thank you for your talk. Yeah, yeah, we're a long way from a UBI, Universal Basic Income. There, In this current budget, they're rolling out the tax on the on the unemployed, new robo-debt recovery operations and other imposts for people who've incurred fines with the courts, etc. 
which will have devastating effects on the, on the poor. Um, my question is that uh, Turnbull was lamenting the other night how he's concerned about future generations having to take on the, on the accrued debt burden. He's deeply concerned about the, 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 the pain that, will be, that will su future generations will suffer, but yet they never mention the, the, the burden of an in, in, the environmental debt. In, in, with a, if they pursue current policies, that the future generations will carry a huge environmental debt in terms of climate change, the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, etc. So that's an issue that's rarely discussed. It's certainly not included in, in this budget. Another thing, like neoliberalism was, as an ideology, was designed effectively to destroy the organised labour movement. And that's sort of the one mechanism that can maintain and increase workers' bargaining power and, and real wages. The, the, this current budget is premised on w wages growth of what? Over 3%? And yet, where is the mechanism to achieve that? The Reserve Bank Governor talks about the need for workers to, to organise themselves to increase wages, but organised labour has been diminished significantly. They don't even increase their own workers' wages within the Reserve Bank. So there's a, there's a real contradiction within the system here. So on the, on, at the point of production, they're, they're maximising their the level of exploitation, but at the point of sale, they can't realise their profits because there's no effective demand in the system. So that's a crisis in the system, a major contradiction. So that's something I'd like, like you to talk about. about. Thanks. They've been too successful by half, neoliberalism. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I, I, I'll do the reef if you'll do the wages. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the, the reef, I, I think, is a wonderful point. Yeah, the, there's an ecological debt. Uh, but the difference about an ecological debt is that it can never be repaid. Once you've done the damage, the damage is done. So that seems to me to be a much worse debt to leave to future generations than a financial debt. A financial debt, sure, it does mean that future generations have got to pay uh, interest bill on uh, debts uh, that w are incurred today. But as Troy said, this is always the case with governments. And as long as that's kept within a modest range, it's perfectly reasonable, because if the money is being borrowed now to build up infrastructure, to perhaps transition the economy towards a more sustainable basis, then future generations will thank us for doing so. So I think uh, well, I uh, le le leaving a debt to future generations is not in itself intrinsically a problem unless it's an irreversible debt, as in the case of the environment, or if it's an unreasonably large debt for profligate use of money borrowed today. Profligate and unproductive use. Say two things on wages. F first, on the robo-debt issue that you mentioned. Um, I remember looking at that line in the budget and for the first couple of years it cost money, right? It cost eight, ten million a year. And then in the final year of the four-year period, the forward estimates, it magically delivers $300 million a year, right? That, that's their assumption. And again, it just it puts the emphasis on that $300 million is again not of any macroeconomic significance at all, but for the people who are struck off New Start, um, it is of course of deep personal uh, significance to their daily lives. Um, I'll just quickly say on, on the wages, there's a great table that my boss, Jim Stanford, put together just comparing the coalition tax plan to 3.5% cumulative wage increases, right, and how much they deliver versus the tax plan. So in 21-22, if you're earning $60,000, Jim calculates you get $530 from the coalition tax plan and nearly $6,000 from cumulative wage growth of 3.5%. So it's pretty clear uh, what you're going to get more from, wage increases. Thank you, both of you. Um, both of you. When I'm uh, right here, Frank, I think of my friend Richard Solon, who said he, one of the greatest pleasures in his life was... Uh, one of uh, your courses, uh, Frank Stillwell at uh, Sydney University. Um, uh, Richard Solon is his name. That was before the age of mobile phones. Um, also, what I'd like to ask, was there any mention of our brave men and women in uniform bravely fighting um, the brave wars of, of brave empires overseas and our brave people 
bravely persecuting people in uh, Manus and Nauru and elsewhere. The border force, was there any reference to that in the budget? Because I didn't see it. The, the amount of money that squandered um, bravely uh, defending our shores from uh, genuinely persecuted people and genu genuinely brave people, actually. Uh, thank you. Well, it's certainly there in, in the budget, the, uh, the allocation for defence, so-called defence and homeland security expenditures. Yes, okay, quick. Um, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop about superannuation. We know that it's very much in their sights, change to super governance laws, take ACTU out of managing industry funds, things like that. Heard nothing about it in the budget. Was there anything referenced? Is it because it's in the sights of the Royal Commission? I don't think there was anything in the budget. There's no but, reference I heard and, and at it, all. And the Royal Commission is moving on to that yeah, now. And I'm they? just wondering if they're yeah. sort of like holding back so we see what. Because I believe it's one of the targets is the industry funds mm. and what they might be able to do down the track to affect how it's governed um, and, uh, and to try and promote bank and, uh, and the private you know, related funds. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I, I don't think there was a lot of focus on superannuation and there is that big conversation about, you know, trying to get rid of these terrible um, industry funds that deliver such, you know, far superior returns to the, 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 the private, the private fund. retarding our ability to create wealth. Yeah, and the, the one thing about super, which, uh, again, you probably heard about before, but just that that is such a huge hit to the budget, the concessional treatment of superannuation, a so-called tax expenditure, which is, uh, you know, pushing the two concessional treatments push up to 30 billion plus. And th that's about the same size as the defence budget. It's triple the size of New Start, and it disproportionately benefits the, the well-off. And men rather than women. And speaking of women, welcome. Uh, can you give any example, and this is not my question, it's Lee Rhiannon's, uh, of where tax cuts to the wealthy have led to either a stimulus to the economy or wage growth in other countries around the world? Oh, it's a good question. I, I, I have to give you a technical answer. You just don't know because, uh, you know, at any given point of time in the economy, there's so many things happening, you can't ever formally isolate the effect of any one uh, change uh, uh, to, to the cause that drove it. But it, uh, have, having made that formal prelude, I think the answer is no, there's no obvious example. Thanks for the presentation. Um, okay, Don, uh, my pleasure. name's Don Sutherland, and uh, there's certainly a couple of things that I've heard tonight that um, Caroline Pryor and I, I are going to pinch for Workers Radio tomorrow morning on Community Radio, Radio Skid Row. Um, however, my question is based um, on an assumption that I can only put in a pretty rough and ready way, and that is that all government budgets, uh, year by year, adapted as they are, are trying to solve particular problems for the ruling class in the capitalism of the day. Now, uh, as you have said, in the conventional reading of the economy, uh, that's my assumption, um, the, the things are not so bad. It, it's sort of, in macro terms, toddling along. That's not true in many other parts of the world, including competitor nations and also cooperative nations. However, if you look, the last time I looked, um, the rate of profit in Australia is precarious. It is poor. Although total profits generally are up, the rate of profit in the private sector is trending downwards on average. There are a couple, it, because it's an average, of course, that means that in some industries it's going up. Notably, and interestingly, in retail and hospitality, when I last looked, which was in December. But if the rate of profit is going down and trending down, that means there is a problem for the dominant class to which both a neoliberal LNP government and a neoliberal ALP government 
have to try and help them solve. The second part of what it has to do is just enough to keep the masses, the masses quiet, quiescent, just enough. So my question is, uh, what did you learn about what is happening in terms of the bigger economy that the budget is really trying to deal with? Thanks for that straightforward question, comrade. Um, you know, the budget, in, in terms of its outlook, it has quite a positive, the budget, here I'm talking about the budget, has quite a positive outlook in terms of both the Australian and the international economy, right? That growth is picking up a bit in Europe. Right? It's, it's, well, yes, I'd say, I'd say in, in conventional terms, and look, uh, I think we probably don't have enough time to go into Marxian measures of the rate of profit uh, versus conventional measures of um, GDP growth, but you know it's hard. It, it's hard to say that. It's hard to say that. Uh, you know, we. I suppose the the neoliberals or orthodox economists might call this or have called this period a period of secular stagnation, right? And in other language, we could call it a problem of overaccumulation, um, etc. But I, I think it's very difficult to say for sure that we are in such a phase of capitalism. I mean, is, uh, is India going to come off the boil or is it going to go from 7% GDP growth to 10% GDP growth? Uh, some you know, African countries have recorded strong uh, conventionally defined GDP growth in recent years, over the last 10 years. So we've got to keep our eye on the ball in terms of lots of different countries, not just the sort of the centres of capitalism that we are used to paying more attention to. There's my attempt. Here's mine. Um, sorry, Cathy, keeping you going, but you'll, you'll get the last word, don't worry. Um, this this uh, is my attempt at a, a, a Marxian analysis in, in a nutshell. Capitalism is a contradictory system. Yes, budgets, uh, by, particularly by conservative governments, are usually, uh, the, the implicit agenda is to give the capitalist class what it needs. But it's not clear right now what it needs because uh, capitalism needs, for example, it needs a compliant and cheap labour force. But it also needs consumers out there spending up big. And so that tension becomes focused very much on the level of wages in the economy. Wages are simultaneously too high and too low. I mean, it sounds paradoxical, but that's, that's the nature of an embedded contradiction. Wages are too high as a cost of production for the capitalist class, but they're too low for the, uh, maintaining the high level of consumer demand on which the uh, economic system depends. And so you get this terrible unease. You even get the, the governor of the Reserve Bank, who also has got the interests of the capitalist class in mind, although he'd never admitted in quite that language, coming out and saying, oh, workers should be struggling for higher wages. Well, thank you very much uh, for that from the governor of the Reserve Bank. Brilliant. Um, well, yes, he's voicing one of the contradictions that some of the more astute capitalists observe, that if you screw the workers, you also screw your own sales. Uh, and, unless you can pump up the demand from that increasingly affluent, wealthy elite who's already got everything. Yeah, household debt is the other way of pumping it up. But the second contradiction, which are also you could get out of Marxian analysis, such as Marxian political economist James O'Connor, who recently died, God rest his soul, although God was never quite the issue, um, pointed out that, you know, and this is particularly relevant to government budgets, that the capitalist class needs two things. It needs the conditions for accumulation of capital, but it also needs the legitimation. And this was the, the point which you referred to at the end on. It needs a compliant uh, 
and e even perhaps enthusiastic but subjugated uh, population. In other words, it, it needs to ensure that it's raking in the profits, but that uh, people see it, this is a legitimate thing because they're getting sufficient trickle down that they feel they're doing okay themselves. That trickle down might come in the form of wages, but it might come in the form of in increased uh, benefits through the NDIS, be better schools and hospital funding and so on. So you think, oh, well, you know, the capitalist system's basically exploitative, but enough is trickling down to make me feel like a reasonably compliant citizen. That too, it seems to me, is increasingly on the skids. Uh, some would say Donald Trump's election is a reflection of those kind of contradictions, that people sense that there's something quite not, not working right, that there's not enough trickling down to Cleveland, Ohio, and so they're going to turn against their political leadership. They want to drain the swamp because, you know, it, the legitimation isn't working anymore. So, but, but what do they turn to? They turn to a, 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 a shyster big businessman who's, who's going to screw them even more. So the contradiction deepens. Uh, people on the left are never surprised about capitalist contradictions. It just they take evolving forms and, and they go through periods of intensity and then uh, there are sort of quasi-fixes that enable the system to rock on a little bit more comfortably into another era. For a while, ne neoliberalism seemed to be uh, a, a phase that was working, and I'm happy to use that phrase still, uh, Troy. Um, it seemed to be working, but now it, it, the wheels are falling off, and uh, no one quite knows what, what's the set of arrangements that's going to take us through to a future in which the capitalist class will again prosper and feel that, that they're secure. It's, it's a very interesting time in human history. Kathy. Your last word. Um, okay, Kathy Vogan from Politics in the Pub Committee. Um, Troy, I think it would be a wasted opportunity if I didn't ask you to tell us where you're at with UBI. Um, it seems to me that um, both Guy Standing and Carl Whitaker's talk of a very simple idea of enough money to cover our basic needs. But how the hell can that happen in Australia when the sky's the limit with rents and mortgages? What are our basic needs going to cost? I feel that New Start doesn't take this into account. You get this much money, but they don't know what the outgoings are. And it's got to a point where people are giving all their dole to um, people who are uh, negative gearing. So um, how, do we, how do we make that work in Australia? And, 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 and sorry, that's just me caricaturing it, I suppose, but I'd love to know, because you're specialising in this area, uh, what you've been um, looking into. Um, thank you. Thanks for that question. Well, like, like Frank could talk until midnight about inequality, I could really go on about universal basic income. Um, that econometrician that um, Frank mentioned, Ben Phillips, and myself, and Ben Spees Butcher, who is another political economist, are uh, going to put together, we are very close to finishing a, a sort of model for Australia for basic income that will be a journal article, which will then, you know, will turn into op-eds and make it a digestible sort of form. Um, and it, it wouldn't be the most radical form. You know, some models of basic income might say, oh, we've got to make it, I don't know, $24,000 a year or something. Straight off the bat, that, that's unlikely to be a starter, right? Particularly in a demigrant form where you give everyone the money, right, and then you tax it all off a bunch of wealthy people plus an additional amount to fund the big increase in your budget cost. So another way would be, and this can sound a little bit technical, but just to look at basic income as a universal income floor, right, which, which say we got a higher new start and it was 16000 a year or something, which is still nowhere near enough, I know, but that with... Um, 
a, a bit of a, a taper rate, so you lose some of that benefit progressively as you earn income. Like you have an unconditional right to get, say, that 16K without stuffing around with Centrelink, without having to humiliate yourself, without any of that kind of stuff that people have to go through now. You've got that in there. Um, and then as you earn, as you get into employment, you progressively lose that benefit. And that may be, it, it reduces that paying everyone money and then taxing it straight back off them, which in technical terms is called fiscal churn and is maybe not the best way of delivering basic income. And it would be far cheaper in terms of its budgetary cost. But just on, on what Frank said about it being affordable, yeah, we could have that type of basic income and still be at a lower tax to GDP ratio than the Scandinavian countries. So is that unthinkable? Is it unimaginable? Is it going to... No. Is it going to be in the next budget? No. But it's still... I like to think of basic income as a pragmatic utopian reform, right? That it has a utopian element to it, but it's also pragmatically addressing people's material needs day to day to day. And the final, I'll shut up after this, but the point you raised about housing I think is absolutely critical because unless you do something about the way our housing market functions with all, you know, the, all the subsidies that go to housing investors, not people who actually just want to live in a home, the lack of investment in social housing, um, the capital gains tax exemptions, all those sort of things, unless you address them, the basic income, you're quite right, could just be a la another landlord subsidy. And that's the last thing we want. So combining, addressing a housing system which is skewed towards the wealthy with the introduction of an initially modest basic income is a possibility. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our evening. Uh, Stuart, you got an announcement? Oh yes. Program has only just been yeah. Yeah. I don't think sure. Uh, next week, uh, 17th of May, we have Israel's Gazan slaughter, G Gazan slaughter, the West moral bankruptcy. The speakers are Samik Badra, who's a doctoral student at the University of Wollongong, to Dr. Nahid Oday, a political analyst and legal researcher, and Dr. Nick Rima from the University of Sydney. He's a lecturer in English and linguistics. So a look at Israel and Gaza next week. Are you chairing that session, Stuart? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. That, that'll be excellent. The West moral bankruptcy. So we turn from the moral bankruptcy of... Uh, Canberra to a, a broader international topic. And I might explain again for people who came in late, we've been focusing on the budget tonight uh, because uh, the scheduled speaker, uh, Justice Michael Kirby, was unable to come and talk about the program topic. That's the problem, I might say, of having a program that's drawn up months ahead. Sometimes there are unforeseeable circumstances. I'm just rehearsing a line that Scott Morrison may, <laughs> may be using in a few months' time when, when uh, the rosy scenario uh, and the rivers of gold uh, dry up. Thank you very much. Th give yourselves a good clap too on the, on the way out. Oh, and, and as you're leaving, uh, 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 just one final announcement. Stop black deaths in custody. Uh, cu custody? Sorry, I've got too much custard in my mouth. Stop black deaths in custody. Protest uh, this coming Saturday, one o'clock outside the Sydney Town Hall. <laughs>